What the heck is that? Oh, that's just a new tundra. A new what? It's the new tundra from Toyota. It's a full-size pickup truck. It's just like the one we've been riding behind for years, except in it's white. Oh, yeah, well, it's a lot more different than just white. It's got your new motor, new chassis, new everything. Why, is it better? I'm not so sure, but then again, I'm kind of set in my ways. But it is pretty, and it is white, and it is the capstone, the top of the line, the full Megillah. Let's go for a ride. I'd rather eat. This is, in fact, the 2022, which to me, as far as I know, is identical to the 2023, except there may be a price difference. Uh, this is the capstone, the top of the line Toyota Tundra. It only comes with a hybridized 3.5 liter twin turbo V6, and it only comes in a crew cab configuration because that's just what we do now. That is what we do. The crew cab is taking over the highways. Even though I think in general people are having fewer kids and there's less need for it than, well, I don't know. I guess this is, this is not, I'm gonna say this a lot. This is not a work truck. Toyota Tundra's new truck is not really designed, number one, to be a work vehicle or to be a farm truck or anything like that. It's designed to be a lifestyle vehicle for people that have a lot of accessories like boats and ATVs and side-by-sides and dirt bikes, that kind of thing, that live in the suburbs. And um, it, I, I don't understand this because the lead engineer of the project of the Tundra lives on a farm, he has a farm. And so there's a lot of things on these new Tundras that I feel like compromise its work truck performance. I'll go over them with you, because they're minor things, it's not anything major, but it just shows that this is the direction the designers and Toyota has decided to go. They, they have decided to go in the direction of lifestyle, you know more of an urban type of vehicle rather than a country type of vehicle. And everything about it's different. Um, it, everything. I mean, there's, there's a few nuts and bolts I think it shares with the old Tundra, but not many. And there is a slight family resemblance, as you no doubt will see when I compare the two right in front of you. But for the most part, this is a fresh sheet of paper. And the capstone is the top of the line, and the hybrid power plant is called the iForce Max. The regular one is the iForce. The old, the old 5.7 liter V8 that was in the old Tundra is called an iForce. But this is the iForce Max, and it has a hybrid powertrain. It's a parallel hybrid powertrain that really doesn't do near as much as most Toyota hybrid powertrains do. It's almost identical to the Ford hybrid system, incidentally. And the two companies did work together uh, years ago to develop a hybrid power plant for a pickup. Then they went their separate ways for reasons, and they will not, neither company will talk about this. It's amazing. They're like, no, they won't tell me anything. But I find it extremely bizarre that they both have 3.5 liter twin turbocharged V6 engines 
with parallel hybrid systems and 10 speed transmissions. It's all the same. What, uh, not, when I say the same, they don't get them from the same supplier. The, actually, the V6s between the two are actually different in construction, but same size displacement. And, you know, like I said, 10 speed transmission. The only real difference with the hybrid system is the battery. And the battery on the Ford is stored down in the chassis outside of the cab and is a lithium ion unit. And the Tundra features a uh, nickel metal hydride battery that is stuck underneath the rear seat. In both of these cases, neither one of these systems, <clears throat> excuse me, adds a hell of a lot of power to the uh, overall drivetrain. Matter of fact, the uh, Sienna uh, hybrid from Toyota just blows them out of the water in terms of how strong <laughs> the electric motors are. It's much more, it's much stronger than these trucks are. So they're, they're opting for most of what you work, well, the, the, the pulling and everything else that gets done, it gets done with the gas engine completely. Uh, the hybrid helps fill in the torque curve down low, which is great. And this thing has a monstrous amount of torque, 583 pounds of feet, as I recall. So that's a lot of torque for any gas engine. And then when you look at it, it's a weeny little V6 3.5 liter, you go, holy crap. That's amazing. It is. It is. It's quite, that's a pretty astounding number. 437 horsepower. I mean, it's, it's a real powerful engine. But is the economy that much approved? No, not really. But that's not what they're looking for. That's not what the targets told them to go for. The targets told them we want more power, we want more horsepower. But you know what else it doesn't have? It doesn't have an appreciably higher payload. In fact, as you'll see when they compare it to our, we have a 2014 Tundra, uh, it has a lower payload capacity than that. And it has uh, about the same, I can't remember exactly what our towing capacity is, but there's not a great leap in towing capacity in the new ones. And like this particular configuration, when uh, I keep talking about how popular uh, they've made the, the four-door crew cab. You're in real trouble if you want to haul a gooseneck or a fifth-wheel trailer or something like that because crew cabs with short beds, it won't work. You'll smash into the back of the cab. It, it's like a bad choice. And yet it's harder to get, and Toyota doesn't even make a regular cab, it, it, but they do make a double cab. And you can do it with a double cab, and then you can actually get an all the way up to an eight foot bed with the uh, double cab. But the vehicle right in front of you, as you can probably tell, it has a 5.5 foot short bed on the back of it. So look at that. Most of the truck is made up of hood and cabin with a little bed on the back. Little bed, but it's a good bed it, because it's made, this is one of the improvements that I like in this truck is the, uh, bed itself is constructed of a composite, a very tough composite that uh, is not going to rust. It's lighter. It's real tough. I mean, this, the thing about it, when you're getting this on your new Tundra, this is not something that hasn't been tested because similar material, possi quite possibly the same basic material, is used, has been used in the Tacoma for years now and it's held up real well. And like I said, it has, also has the benefit of being lighter in weight. And the only problem that they had was uh, it was really slick if it got wet. So what Toyota's done is there's a couple of different things you can do. One is get a factory applied spray, which I believe this has. If you look at it, it's a sort of a rough, rough substrate there. Well. It's got a lot of traction to it, real traction to it. Uh, might actually be difficult to slide some things in and out, but uh, that's one choice is this spray that goes on top of which I'm 99% sure this truck has. If it doesn't have it, oops, but I think it does. The other is a uh, bed mat that they can put into it, which will also provide you with some traction when it's wet. And as you can see, you got your cleats in here and you got your wonderful LED lights all the way up on the top of the cab, on both sides. So that's a great, great thing. And it naturally has a, look at that, that's ice in there. It's cold, cold here. Uh, the tailgate is a dawdled lift and up, up and down because it's got their system in it. 
But I'll tell you what's bad. Here's, we put this back down again. Uh, there's not an easy way to get in if the tailgate's down. So what they've done is they've put in this step that's power operated that slides out. So it's real easy to use and real easy to, that, that's just great. But my question is, why don't you just put a pocket right there like everybody else does these days, right here, so you can put your foot in it and get in that way. This, like on the other trucks, I don't know if it's a standard on the capstone, it probably is. Better be for $77,000. But uh, it's power actually, it's much more complex. And if you want it on the other Tundras, you have to pay for it. And I think it's like six, 700 bucks. See, watch her fold up now. Whee! Neato, huh? So, did I miss that? Did I miss that little lift up part? Let's do that again. Hang on. Wow. All right, now, let's do it. Let's do it properly. Yeah. There we go. That's cool. <laughs> okay, now, here's, here's the most controversial thing about me in this truck, and this is where the, the engineers that I've communicated with at Toyota and I part company, uh, as far as, well, they think, they, they're telling me this isn't true, but here's, here goes. Here's, here's my theory here. <clears throat> the, the frame on this vehicle is different from the previous frame on the, on the previous generation Tundra. The previous generation has an excellent, what I think is an absolute excellent frame on it. Uh, and, the, you know, the first generation had a great frame on it. Unfortunately, there were some real problems with the manufacturer, and they rusted out real quick uh, in salty areas and... There's all kinds of, re that's a story in itself, because I, I used to have a friend that worked at Toyota that uh, got me inside information all the time. And I never shared this with the public, but I know exactly what the company it was and what the whole situation was, and it was, it was a mess. But the frame itself, the design was excellent. And uh, they vastly improved it on the 2007, or the uh, second generation Tundra, and it's called the triple tech frame. And how it works is the front section of it, probably I would say from uh, up here at the beginning and probably to about here, about mid door, slightly further is fully boxed. Then after that, you have what is called double C channel, which is a C, open C channel, but there's two layers to, there's two completely different layers to it. So it's still really stiff. And then when you go out to the bed area, uh, like right here, it's full open C channel. Now, why do they do that? Well, they did that for, to have the right amount of flex in the right part of the truck. And when you have a pickup, with the, you always notice this, you'll see this on like the Ridgeline and the Santa Cruz and all these other things. Even on, uh, what was it? What was that Chevrolet that had that uh, mid-gate in it and everything else, the Avalanche? Uh, you, you usually have a completely separate structure for the bed. And this is why this is not one piece going from the cab over to the bed. The bed needs to ride separately because the bed needs to flex from side to side. Now some go, no, no flex, no flex ever, no. Manly, I do not want to flex. No, no, look, guys, it's real important for that for that bed to flex because that way it does a number of things. It improves ride quality overall, but it also takes some of the strain completely off the rear axle and suspension. It makes the vehicle track better off road because you have a little bit of flex. It it's more likely to keep the wheels on the ground and. Uh, so, so all these things work together. It improves the ride quality and everything else and does nothing in terms of harming towing capacity in the least or load capacity for that matter if it's properly engineered and it was. I still think that triple tech frame was a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, this doesn't have that. What this has is a fully boxed frame from end to end and it 
in my opinion, this is all my opinion, this is where we part company, uh, me and the Toyota engineers, uh, this frame was literally picked because it's a Land Cruiser frame. And they've modified it a bit to accommodate the fact that it's now in a pickup and they've changed, their, they have the ability now when they build the side rails on, these, on the frame to use different types of metal so that they can add stiffness where they need to and that kind of thing and add flex where they need to if they need to. Well, that's, that's one of the reasons why this vehicle has uh, a completely different rear suspension. It has the same rear suspension that the Land Cruiser does because the frame's designed for that. And what kind of suspension is that? Well, it's a multi-link coil spring rear suspension. The previous Tundras had a leaf spring rear suspension. Super simple. Uh, it worked great, in my opinion, and actually the ride quality was perfectly acceptable. It was good, actually. Uh, and I can still tell by driving, you know, our 85,000 mile 14 on the same rough roads as this thing, and it rides, and actually, in certain circumstances, it actually rides better. But there's those coil springs, and, and the coil spring multi-link is much more complicated. I'm sure it's more expenses to manufacture except for the fact that you have economies of scale as you don't have to have it changed to accommodate leaf springs instead they decide to just leave it the way it was and put coils on there or in this case instead of coils you have air springs so that's a big difference and what Toyota told me was why it sure looked to me like this is just a borrowed Land Cruiser frame that they've tweaked for the Tundra and they said no we actually had on the previous generation less input to the Toyota frame uh, on the Tundra side of the design process than we did on this one. This one we had a lot more influence on how the frame was designed than we did on the previous unit. It doesn't look that way to me. I mean it looks to me like it's a Land Cruiser frame. Everything about it screams that to me. And that's, and the, by the way, it's not a horrible thing. Land Cruisers are fantastic vehicles. I mean, and it's tough and everything else, but the fact is it's an SUV and it has completely different demands on what it needs to do as a frame, especially a frame for a vehicle that's driven off-road all the time, than a pickup truck that's designed to pull big trailers and haul big loads. So, you know, that's the thing. Is it worse? No, I mean, it's, it's probably better, I guess. But my initial reaction to all this is that. Uh, that's what they've changed on this truck that I'm a little, con con not concerned about, but it seems like it's a whole lot more complicated. And I don't think, I, I'm not seeing an improvement. And like I, uh, I point out, our Tundra, our 14 has a 100 pound higher load capacity than this thing does. This has got air springs and everything. And I know it's heavier because it's got lots of goo-boos on it because it's the top of the line and it's a, a crew cab instead of an extended cab. But still, I would expect that's one area they would really want to knock it out of the park as far as uh, for pickup truck competition is payload capacity. And it's really not any better than it was on the previous one. So anyway... Uh, I know this doesn't sound, I, it sounds like I'm just sitting here complaining about this truck, and I don't mean to be. I just think I'm, I'm fascinated that Toyota decided to go in this direction with it. And the Capstone's the ultimate expression of the urban pickup, which has a very different role than what we require out here. Especially those guys, boy, they, uh, they have their, they, they have their needs, their demands. And they're not real sure about this truck. They like the other one because, well, they know the other one well. And maybe that's my problem too. I'm prejudiced because the previous Tundra was such a good truck. So let's move on. Okay, we? look at here. What do we have? Well, we have a real interesting generational change right in front of you. On the right is a 2014, which is uh, pretty much identical to the 2021 Toyota Tundra. And on the left, we have a 2022, even though this is well into 2023, they sent me a 2022, so go figure, uh, Toyota Tundra. Now, the right side is the SR5 version, which was the next to the uh, base model. 
and it is also a, a double cab instead of a crew cab. Otherwise, it's pretty much identical to the rest of its pack back in 2021, which is the last of this particular model run. And on the left is the uh, crew cab uh, capstone hybrid version, top of the line, if you will, of the new Tundra. And uh, they're real interesting trucks because they're so different. And uh, I have the uh, fortune to be able to drive them back to back and, and see uh, the uh, one on the right has about 85,000 miles on it, I believe. And a lot of rust, which is not the fault of the manufacturer as much as the people that put all the salt on the roads up here. Because <laughs> we, can't, we can't always clean our trucks like every other week, every week, all the time, especially during when, when you have a heavy winter. But anyway. Uh, and, and uh, let me give you some numbers. That's why I've got the camera locked off just so I can uh, give you some numbers here. The new engine, of course, on the capstone is the hybrid engine, which comes standard on the capstone, which is the top of the range. And it is a 3.5 liter twin turbocharged V6 with a hybrid addition. And the hybrid is a parallel hybrid. It's uh, dramatically less influential on the engine performance than say a, uh, oh, I don't know, a 2019 uh, RAV4 hybrid, which actually has a much more powerful <laughs> electric motor in it. I don't know why they did that, but that's what they did. But the horsepower uh, is 437 at 5,200 RPM, and the torque is a whopping 583 foot-pounds of torque at 2,400 RPM, a nice, nice lower uh, peak for that and it's a pretty wide torque peak too so that's very good for towing and hauling the 2014 the old boy has a 5.7 liter normally aspirated v8 engine which is a beauty uh, it has 381 horsepower and 401 foot pounds of torque so you got more, a lot more horsepower and torque with the newer engine uh, and it also uh, there's a big difference in terms of uh, estimated fuel economy. The new one with its hybridization gets uh, about 20 miles per gallon overall. So anyway, there's a, a the, here's the real interesting uh, differences to me. The, uh, the new one, the, the capstone has a 10-speed automatic transmission with a 331 rear axle ratio, whereas the old guy has six, six speeds and a 4.3 rear axle ratio quite a difference and that's you know like I said there's all kinds of kabuki that goes on when they design these things in terms of the number of available speeds to the transmission going to the rear axle and what does that mean ultimately well and what was it aimed at I think it was aimed at more than anything else uh, fuel economy that's what they were trying to do and uh, they've, they've been successful to a small degree but uh, I think a lot of people were expecting something revolutionary out of the fuel economy just because that's what Toyota does on a regular basis. Uh, they, they, the hybridization of a vehicle makes an enormous difference. It does not on this truck because it is a parallel system, like I said. It's much smaller. The battery fits under the rear seat, and uh, it's a parallel system, so it really doesn't... I don't notice the electric motor most, except when you're backing up. I, it usually does that in full electric, but there's not even an EV button that I could find. There's a lot of buttons in that truck. Uh, so you can just run on electric power by itself. It is, it's just not there. It doesn't exist. Um, what else can I tell you about this? Well, in terms of payload, now the uh, capstone has a five and a half foot bed, which I'll go into. You'll get a better shot of it in a minute. And uh, the one on the right, the 2014, has a 6.5 a foot bed, but it is a, a double cab instead of a full crew cab. However, the one on the right has uh, nearly exactly 100 pound higher payload capacity of 1,430 pounds as opposed to the capstone, which is 1,330 pounds. So it actually has a higher uh, load capacity and it's older. And I don't get that. I, I think that when you, when, you, when you wait 15 years to completely do a redesign, you think it would be approved in every single category, but it doesn't. And that's just what happened. I mean, <laughs> I have all kinds of explanations why I think it is the way it is, um, which I'll go into later. Uh, and Toyota doesn't agree with me, by the way. <laughs> 
<laughs> amazingly, the engineer that I had email conversations with about the truck uh, just disagrees with me on a lot of things. Like for instance, I don't think the ride quality is, is any better whatsoever. It steers better, the handling is better on the new one, but the old one, uh, to me, the ride quality is about the same. And the, and the ride quality on the old one was fine. It's perfectly acceptable for a full-size pickup. And we have regularly carried over 2,000 pounds in the back of this truck. Uh, we regularly, or my wife regularly tows about a six to 7,000 pound trailer with horses in it, uh, and it does an excellent job of doing that. Uh, so the, the, from a capability standpoint, I think the older truck was every bit as capable as the newer. And so what do you get? Well, first of all, the price difference is amazing. Those two trucks right there, it's been nine years, I'll grant you that. But the truck on the left is nearly twice as expensive as the truck on the right. We paid uh, around, around $39,000, $40,000 for the truck on the right back in 2014. And this 2022 is stickered out at $77,000. So there you go. The wheel sizes, look at the difference in the wheel size. The, the, the uh, capstone is unique in that it has 22-inch wheels. And that's all about style. That's not about function. And... Uh, it limits a lot of things, uh, and, and including the fact that it doesn't have a uh, full-size spare tire. It has a temporary spare tire that's an 18-inch tire, which you know doesn't even have the same diameter, I don't think, as this, this particular tire. We'll get into that more later, but that doesn't make sense because this vehicle is a four-wheel, part-time four-wheel drive vehicle, and if you're in out in the middle of nowhere and you're driving on a highway somewhere and you have a flat and you have to use four wheel drive because there's a lot of snow and ice on the road. Uh, it's not good on the drivetrain to have a different size tire on one of those, but you know, I'm sure they've thought about all this, I hope. So uh, with that, let's, ha let's have a quick look, shall we? As I will say the magic words, Alakazam and we shall open the hoods. Or how about everybody raise your hood if you're made in if you were made in San Antonio? Well, how about that? Everybody's made in San Antonio. <laughs> how about that? Hello, Riverwalk. Been a long time since I've been in San Antonio. Okay, uh, here's a quick look here, just so you can see this engine bay situation. Uh, on our old 5.7 liter V8, which is kind of dirty. Sorry. Sorry about that. There you have it. There's a lot of wires and things, but it's uh, normally aspirated, so it's actually very, very straightforward. Sorry about the camera shadow. Oh, there, we got rid of that. But here's your airbox right over here. And there's just one on this one because, uh, well, as you'll see, the complex complexity of the newer engine is vast. Uh, and incidentally, it, it holds about, what was it? I think it's just under eight quarts of oil. They both hold about the same amount of oil, incidentally, even though this is a bigger engine, uh, which is very interesting. And, and the coolant capacity is roughly the same for the engine itself until you get to the intercoolers on the new one. And then you have another four or five quarts of uh, coolant that goes through there. So a lot more coolant in the new one. But as you can see, it's a, that looks like your uh, truck with 85,000 miles on it, V8. Uh, from a reliability standpoint, this has been, uh, we haven't done anything to it but change the oil. It's been great. Very, very good. I love the feel of this engine too. It's just an excellent, excellent V8 engine. And over here, look, here's something much cleaner. Here we have our 3.5 liter twin turbo V6 with the hybrids. And uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's pretty crowded underneath here, but it, there's a lot of stuff. And you have an air box here, right here, that feeds that particular turbocharger area. And over here, you got another one. So they each have their own, they each have their own intercooler. Down below, down in here, there's actually a, a intercooler on both sides. Uh, if you've ever seen, uh, when, when this truck was first announced and they had the truck launch, wherever it was, uh, they had a chassis that was completely removed as far as the bodywork goes so you could see everything and you could see the size of the intercoolers and everything else and so uh, overheating will not be a problem with this truck I predict because they've really done 
a lot of work. Another interesting thing about that is the, uh, as you know, your turbocharger comes out. Here's on the, on the passenger side here. Turbocharger is attached to your uh, exhaust manifold usually, and the exhaust manifold is usually bolted to the head. But on these engines, the head and the exhaust manifold are one. They are actually one unit. And so that the exhaust manifold itself actually has coolant going through it as well to help cool it. So that's really clever. And uh, it, it uh, where's the hybrid stuff come in? Well, it runs, it's the, the actual hybrid motor is located between the engine and the transmission underneath, which is uh, very different from typical Toyota practice in that you usually have a big motor inside the transmission. In fact, the transmission is technically kind of an electric unit. It's a, it's called a constant, uh, continuously variable transmission, but it actually is an electric unit. But this is a completely normal, typical type of 10 speed automatic transmission that they've put in this truck. So, and that may be one of the reasons why the electric assist is not that big a deal on this truck, because it really isn't. Uh, but again, you get some really, really good numbers out of it, uh, especially the torque, 583 foot-pounds of torque, which that's a lot of torque for a gas engine, especially one that only displaces 3.5 liters. That's, we're getting into rarefied air with stuff like that. Uh, as you can see, though, we still have the, the problem that I don't like about the hood on this truck is it doesn't open very much. It, uh, come to think of it, you know, if you look at the older Tundra, it doesn't open in a huge gaping maw, but it does open more than the new truck does. And uh, I, I hit my head playing around with that new one, and I've, I've never had that problem with this one. Even though this one could open more too, but it's weird the things you notice, because for some reason I notice that, and if you'll go back to, I believe it is the uh, Volvo, I think it's the C60 video. Uh, that's how, how much I, uh, I like a hood to open. It opens way up, like, and I like to have it out of the way so there's plenty of light in there so when you're tinkering. And, uh, of course, these are Toyotas, so you, hopefully you won't have to do much tinkering underneath there. Change your oil, just do that, and you'll be in good shape. All right, so there you go. Interesting. Uh, twin son, twin brothers with different mothers, but they both come from... San Antonio, yeah. Have a look here. This is our 2014 rear suspension. And uh, as you can see, it's just your standard issue going back many, many, many decades of a, a leaf spring rear suspension. Very, very simple. The shocks are staggered and they're outboard of the frame. They talk about the shocks on the new uh, Tundra being outboard like that's a big deal, but that, I think the shocks have been mounted outboard of the frame since the Tundra first appeared in 2000. <laughs> but there you go. Uh, and it's extraordinarily simple. All the links you have are the, literally the link of the uh, right here and up front, the links of the leaf spring to the frame and then uh, to the rear axle itself. And that's it. That's how complicated it is. But it's very well calibrated, this rear suspension. It's also... Uh, very well rusted <laughs> but that's uh, like I said that's more because of the roads uh, than the vehicle itself because I've not had time to do a better job of keeping everything clean you can keep these these things will last forever almost if you uh, actually take better care of them but look at the size of that pumpkin that differential right there that would be your 4.3 rear axle ratio by the way and it has your uh, automatic anti-spin control which transfers brake uh, what what essentially does if you have one tire spinning the uh, other tire uh, will not typically with an open differential like this is will just keep on uh, doing nothing while the free tire spins because the uh, torque goes down into the rear axle through the differential to the path of least resistance but the anti-spin technology means it grabs the spinning tire with a brake and therefore transfers your torque from like if this one's uh, spinning to this wheel, and uh, this is further enhanced by automatic ATAC, which is, I think, automatic traction assist control, 
which unlike uh, say on the forerunner which is uh, you you put it in low and manually set it in this one if it's in low range it's automatically present to help get you unstuck and it works pretty well actually quite well so anyway but the suspension is what I'm most interested in because this is where we had the biggest change between the uh, the previous generation to the current generation the second generation to the third generation or our capstone and as you can see the frame is uh, if you've got really good eyes you look all the way down there you can see it's boxed to about midpoint in the front door and then uh, it's double C channel two layers of C channel from there on back to where it pivots upward and then it's open C channel all the way back here and uh, provides different uh, parts of flex to a different part of the uh, uh, frame which uh, works really really well at keeping the rear wheels on the ground as well as uh, plenty strong for off-road work or carrying a very heavy load in the trunk a trunk caught in the bed area so <laughs> anyhow that's uh, that's how that all works and right up here you got you full-size spare tire something you will not see on the capstone but there you go there's our uh, our 2014 which is the same as the 2021 rear suspension very very straightforward very simple and I think works quite well. So now we'll take a look at that other, the new one. And here we are, Marty. We've gone back to the future. All right, here we have our 2023 Capstone Tundra. Uh, as you can see, there's uh, very little rust, uh, none, actually. <laughs> uh, the joys of newness. Well, what we have here is a multi link rear suspension. Uh, that is considerably more complicated than on the 2014 Tundra. You've got your lower link prominent in this view right, right, China, right there. And here we have our uh, optional air spring right there. If you did not have the optional air, if you did not have the optional air spring, you would have a coil spring sitting right there. But the uh, air suspension adjusts for, for all kinds of things when you're towing the trailer as far as your tongue you know, the squat that takes place when you load your trailer on and if you load it up with all kinds of, I don't know, what do you carry with a $77,000 truck? I guess you carry uh, Chippendales or something in the back of it. The Chippendale uh, furniture, whatever. But um, it uh, it also has, a, this is a panhard rod that goes side to side. Then it has a top link switcher, uh, which are in there somewhere. Oh, here we go. This structure here, this superstructure that you see right here, attaches to the top link. So you have one, two, three, four links plus this cross link right here, uh, which also sort of doubles as a. It's interesting you don't have a sway bar. I don't know why I thought there was an anti sway bar on the last Tundra, new Tundra I had, the new generation, but maybe not. But as you can see, looking forward, uh, there's no evidence here that this is a hybrid because the battery is tucked away under the rear seat and the drive the actual motors and everything else are incorporated inside I think near the transmission housing or something it's completely different from a typical Toyota hybrid system which uh, it's basically identical to what Ford uses and I as I think I've alluded to therein lies a tail but as you can see, the uh, the rear axle is also quite substantial, and I believe the rear ratio is a three point something. So it's a completely different rear axle. But you got to remember this uh, this vehicle has a ten speed automatic transmission as opposed to the old fourteen, which has a six speed automatic transmission. So that could be part of it. But uh, that's it. That's a real change right there. And uh, no matter what Toyota says, I still say that this is basically a rear suspension and frame that is modified from the Land Cruiser to suit the needs of the Tundra. And it's, you know, they, they tell me, no, no, it's basic, basically this has a lot more to do with what the Tundra design was for, uh, more proprietary for it. I don't believe that for a second, but that's me. You know, I, I have my rights. <laughs> to believe what I want but to me adding all this complexity with the multi-link system I mean I have yet I haven't driven this one that much yet and I will over all kinds of surfaces but so far 
just back to back driving with the 14 i don't think the ride quality is that better that much better if if better at all really and i've talked to toyota about this and they just say well we beg to differ you know so they can do that and as we go on through here you can see part of the frame in here let me get my my trusty light up here for you there we go as you can see the uh the frame is quite substantial in the rear especially, so it's well set up for towing. Fully boxed, unlike the open channel, C-channel, which is on the 2014. Which is better? Uh, it depends. Uh, they, they both have their uses. Um, all I can tell you is I don't think Toyota would ever put a crappy frame on a truck. Or, or a frame that's not up to the task. They certainly are going to. So, And that's just the way they're going. I still think, though, it's it's it's... There's more Land Cruiser under here than there is proprietary Tundra, in my opinion. And that's not bad. I mean, when I'm saying that, I'm not insulting the truck. <laughs> I'm just saying that I think that's what they're doing. It's kind of an economy of scale thing. And I think we're going to see something similar with the new Tacoma, unless they, Toyota does what I want them to do, and I want them to basically bring over the uh, Hilux from Europe and just make an American version of the Hilux, because it's a better pickup, I think. But that's just me. All right. So much for your lovely undercarriage. And this, by the way, the rear air suspension is now on high so that I have a little bit more room. You can also lower it down uh, at the push of a button thanks to the air springs to make it easier to load under certain circumstances. And then put it on automatic and it'll level itself. So there you go. Thank you for watching. Bing. So there you are. Uh, remember when I was talking about that, uh, that there, uh, I, I thought it had a sway bar on it, it, it and I couldn't see it? Well, it's because it's mounted to the front of the axle, you see, there it is. So between all these links and the sway bar and the panhard rod, you have a lot of links on this axle. A lot of points of connection, a lot of little joints, just a lot of stuff, all to control the rear axle. Whereas on the old model, all you have is a leaf spring on each side and one point of contact with the axle and the spring. Two points of contact with the spring to the frame, and that's it. So, is this that much better? Is this much more refined? Is this a better suspension? I'm not convinced. I am not convinced. But it is what you'll see on pretty much every SUV, including the Land Cruiser, from which this was derived. See, I'm Mr. Controversy. I'm controversial in my views. But there you go. There's that sway bar I was talking about. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you one thing. That is one of the biggest anti-sway bars I've ever seen. This diameter on this is enormous, which is inter interesting indeed. And as you can see, this is like I say, it's more of an urban prowler. It's not your off-roader because this... It's just rubber instead of the uh, wonderful uh, steel skid plates of old, <laughs> which I'm sure the TRD versions come with, or, or, or polymer or some damn thing. But here we have, we also have this, uh, this, this right here is your undeployed, it's not deployed at the moment, a front spoiler. And it comes down to certain speeds to help your gas mileage, to help streamline your underside here so that you have uh, more aerodynamics and ultimately better highway gas mileage. And it's all, it's got actuators and everything else. There's, there's more little electric motors on this truck than uh, you've ever seen in your life. And there's also big electric motor too. I mean, it's all about the electricity. I'm telling you. And the suspension is a uh, double A arm, by the way. Uh, there's your coil up there. Beautiful, isn't it? It's clean. Uh, the thing about this is it's very, very similar to the previous Thunder, but it has been improved, ad adopted to the new package that it's in. And that's pretty much every vehicle, all the, uh, the, the Coma, the Sequoia, the Land Cruiser, all of them have that double A-arm suspension, and pretty much everybody else is cancel has canceled, has copied it as well, and I still don't know who had it first. Uh, <coughs> But it has become the thing for pickups in this kind of vehicle is to have this kind of suspension. Why? Well, you can do a lot with it. It's lightweight. It can be built really stout. But the best thing about it is you can add or, or remove 
uh, front wheel drive components for four wheel drive operation very easy without dramatically modifying the suspension. And on some trucks, I mean, you get to the heavy duty trucks, you have a completely different front suspension because a lot of them just have a straight axle or some of them. But uh, like, for example, with GM trucks, they have a completely different or had a completely different suspension on the uh, half ton with coils. And then when they went to four wheel drive, you suddenly had torsion bars instead, a, a very different design. But with the double A arm design and coils, you can uh, you can do both. You can do two wheel drive and four wheel drive. Very much economies of scale, don't you see? How do you Thank like you. your wheels? Large? Extra large Ferris wheel. Well, here we go. 22 inch wheels on the capstone. And it gets really interesting with that. And I've, I've got questions in the Toyota right now because uh, the spare on this vehicle is only an 18 inch. It's a different size tire and it's also a temporary tire, temporary spare on a pickup. And I was told, no, we, we you know, all Tundras come standard with full size spares. No, I, this one doesn't. And it's, it, it's a, it, would that matter? Well, yeah, it kind of does for a lot of different reasons. The biggest being, this is a four-wheel drive vehicle, and it has part-time four-wheel drive, so it doesn't have a, uh, when, it's, when you're in four-wheel drive, you don't have a uh, differential in between the front and the back so that the wheels can turn at different speeds. They need to all turn at the same speed. And one of the reasons you facilitate that, or one of the ways, excuse me, you facilitate that is by having all four wheels the same size. Behold. Looky there. Behold the beginnings. There, we're going to start up now. <laughs> I just wanted you to see that little display. They're all doing it nowadays with those little display things on there. And that's, uh, I find that. I find that entertaining, let me put it that way. And for uh, $77,000, you better be entertained, you know what I'm saying? So here we have our capstone uh, instrument cluster, your cockpit, if you will. And it is 100% virtual in nature with analog type displays. And uh, in the very center there, you have a tachometer. Whee! Uh, and your uh, speedometer is, of course, digital in the middle. And then to your lower left, you have both your oil pressure and your ammeter, or your charging status. And that charging status is your truck battery, not the uh, hybrid battery. And over to the right, there's your hybrid battery right there. And we're about a little past uh, half strength. But this, uh, this little gauge here will tell you when there's, that's where you, you, you zoom the engine there and it, it's doing something with the battery, I assume charging it, uh, because there's no, there's no reason for the battery to be doing anything. Because we're not moving, we're just sitting here. So on the, on the side next to it here in this little gauge, we have our uh, turbocharger, Zuh, since there are two on our V6. And when I do that, we're not doing any turbo at this time, but, uh, you can watch it as you're driving along, and it's it's very active. All kinds of stuff going on there to make it fun. So, <laughs> I, I do like having information like that because it is interesting to see what all this complexity is up to. You got turbochargers, you got a hybrid system, you got everything all playing with each other. So, that's you know, it's nice to know when you need to know what the heck is going on. Now, in the middle, we have our, uh, or excuse me, on the left hand side, we have our determinant which is it determines what you want to look at at that particular moment in this case uh, we uh, have distance to empty on there we have this is what our average has been over the last 266 miles 17.2 miles per gallon uh, which is good for a great big truck almost but not not hybrid territory uh, the main reason this truck has a hybrid system is to smooth out and increase the torque curve, which is good for towing, although like I mentioned before, the actual towing capacity is lower than the non-hybrid version of the 3.5 liter twin turbo V6. So go figure, you know, it's complex. 
Uh, here's our distance to empty still 266 with a 32 gallon tank, which this has. Uh, you got some serious range, which is laudable. And what else do we have here? Well, there's our compass. And our uh, audio is turned off at the moment. And then we have, uh, here's our trailer section, which is, gives you your, uh, you have your little trailer controller. Whee! Right down there. That's standard kit. And uh, you can go down and this is when you select your trailer and go into a mode such that auto mode will tell you approximately the length of the trailer. It has to know all this for all these uh, various things you can do with your automatic trailer backing system which is pretty cool and i think i have to check on this but i think it also will help affect your blind spot warning system which will expand the range of when uh if you have something in your blind spot that's right next to your trailer it will alert you that there's a car over there which is fantastic and look at the perfection the true perfection of the tire pressure. Ah, that's that's admirable. You got to love that. And so anyway, what else do we have here? We have our, this is our uh, lane keeping assist. Uh, lane tracing is at, currently off, I think. I've had trouble turning it on and off. <clears throat> it, it, as, as far as, a, well, actually I've had turn, uh, trouble turning it off because it seems to have wanted to steer the truck a lot of times when I didn't want it to, which is most annoying. I don't appreciate that, <clears throat> but they'll do what, whatever they want, you know. And there's our uh, pol uh, collision uh, warning system. And there we have our blind spot monitoring system, which we always have on. Then we have our parking assist. Our rear cross traffic alert is on. Our HUD main is off. You want me to turn that on for a minute? I'll turn it on. There it is. Can you see it? I don't know if you can see it or not. Uh, I have no use for you. I'm making you go away. There we go. Uh, then we have our RSA. I never, you know, to this day, I've, I've had several Toyotas that have that. Uh, it's something alert. Rear I don't know what it means, and I've been meaning to look it up on every single Toyota I've had. I still don't know what that is. Quiet now. Quiet. Uh, here we go. Um, sorry about that. I got momentarily distracted. Uh, customize the right side. This is, uh, what do we do when we do that? I'm sorry, let me go back there. Let's go back to customize the right side. I'm not sure what that does. Well, I'm not, I'm no help at all. God. Then our trailer settings, that's actually very important. Um, well, I'm trying to get it to do some things that it just doesn't feel the mood to do. Trailer settings. There we go. <clears throat> then you add a trailer and you, you put everything back into the position you want it to be in terms of what kind of trailer you're using. And I believe you can put more than one trailer in there yeah you can absolutely you can edit and delete a particular trailer and you give the information to the truck basically about how long the trailer is and that sort of thing so it will adjust uh some of your trailer stuff accordingly which is great that's a very nice feature and this one i love trailer light check and it, it can actually tell you what sort of situation you have with your trailer lights trailer light check will cycle the turn signals and brake lamps 10 times so you'll be able to know. Isn't that great? That's excellent. A lot of manufacturers are doing that now, and that's I, kudos to all of you for doing that. And then there's your uh, instrument cluster settings. We move on. Message section is clean of messages. And uh, I'm thinking about what in the world. When I first got this truck, usually the, uh, the, the gas mileage was... I think about 20 overall, and that's over the, probably a pretty wide scope of it. This truck has about 2,200 miles on it. And so it was a longer period. The 17.2 here is uh, basically what I've gotten over the last four or five days. And it's really been mixed. There's been some highway stuff. There's been some low speed stuff. It's been a little bit of everything. So. Uh, with a with an equivalent 5.7 liter previous generation Tundra, I probably would have gotten about 15. 
So it's a couple of miles per gallon better, which is something. It's better. It's better. It's it's fine. It's fine. Okay, now we move over to the Jumbotron. Uh, this is one big screen. I tell you, I find this amazing, this screen size, uh, vehicle uh, trip information. Look at all this. This is, you could do a PowerPoint presentation on this thing. It's so big. It's 14 inches from here to here. Uh, I'm not sure personally how I feel about it. I think it's a little bigger than I like. I find it distracting sometimes. And all that means is if I own this truck, after a month or so, I'd be completely used to it. And anything smaller would look too small. So <laughs> I've discovered that with a lot of cars, especially a car we own, that when we first got it, I thought the screen was kind of big. Now it seems absolutely perfect. I'm, I'm thinking this will probably be the same. Uh, the the non-big version of this... <laughs> <laughs> which uh, on the capstone this is the standard version but on other vehicles other tundras uh, is a 10 inch screen I believe and uh, you can optionally get it's all part of the advanced navigation sound system as as it usually is and this kind of a kind of a deal uh, now down here we have our climate control selection and as usual it's uh, Pretty much the same in almost all vehicles you get. You got your heated seats. You got your ventilated. There it is. Can you hear it? Woo! Listen to that. Woo! Oh, boy. Blowing me away here. Oh, that's nice. Uh, but, yeah, I have all your usual settings where you can sync the front and the back. And, the, uh, excuse me, the left and the right. Now, do we have a back section here? Uh, no, we do not. We do have a standard USB port right there though and we drop down more here is our backup towing mode if I hit that uh, trailer backup guide no save trailers TGB is canceled so but if we had a trailer in there and I hit that it would it would go into its backing up mode and give you instructions on exactly what you need to do to make it do all kinds of magical things on its own here's our uh, our camera view and here we do with the 360 here isn't that great? That doesn't have the kitty. The kitty was right next to here just a minute ago. Sure enough, he's run off. See, the, the truck knows. The truck knows these things. Then you have your uh, uh, anti, uh, your stability, your traction control, rather, on-off switch. Now here we have your manual and your uh, when you, if you want to raise and lower the the height. And what we're doing. Here is what I'm saying here. Now, this is how we raise and lower our rear suspension. It's interesting on this truck that it's only a rear suspension thing that you play with. It is not a front suspension. It's all air in the back only in the front. As you saw, is only coil springs, or as you will see if you haven't seen it yet. If I hadn't done that bit yet, but uh, you do have some adaptability. You can lower it to, in order to make it easier to load. And then you can raise it if you're in your uh, situation where you need more clearance. But when it's on automatic mode, which it is most of the time, uh, it's going to adjust. It has uh, all kinds of sensors and things back there that will uh, adjust your ride height, especially when you hook up a trailer and have a pretty substantial tongue weight. It'll help balance it out so that it's more level, which is uh, better for your towing attitudes and your, <laughs> and your headlight aiming. It, it's good for that. Uh, we, we move further down. We got our, uh, well, first of all, uh, we got our, for some reason, the park brake is here, which is kind of strange, but whatever. <laughs> uh, here is our mechanical shifter, and manual mode is kicked to the left. We have 10 count them 10 forward speeds and it's currently in fourth fourth gear why is it in fourth gear fifth third second beep, beep. second gear third fourth fifth there you go and back to drive and our drive modes include yes yes i'm hitting drive modes and nothing's happening what is happening oh i got i got there we go that little thing way in the corner, it's awfully small. That's where your, uh, what I was doing earlier, there's your manual. 
and now we're lowering the rear of the truck. Oh, boy, that's really small. That's interesting. Yeah, we're like dragging her butt now. But let's bring her back up, shall we? Bring her up. There we go, manual, and then I'll turn the manual mode off, and it'll go back to automatic, and it's back to neutral state, which is good. Now, why is it? There we go. Here's our drive modes. Look at all of them. There's thousands. We have, uh, using this little turning knob right here, we have comfort, we have normal, we have Sport S, we have Sport S Plus, we have custom, which gives you more flexibility. And uh, that's interesting. All the little things it shows you. I had it on Echo, Eco. I'll put it back on normal. Uh, to try to get some more fuel economy out of this hybrid, but it's not, not doing the world's greatest job, is it now? Okay, then we have our, uh, here is our QR charger. Now, one thing I've noticed with Toyotas, when you have a case on your phone, as do I, uh, it, it charges fine if you're not moving, but if it bumps around a little bit, there's a, there's a difficulty. It uh, it tends to have trouble charging because it bounces around a little bit. And if you have a phone, a smartphone that does not have a case on it, I think you're fine. So anyway, okay, moving on. Here's our console. Now this is a, a wild critter. You slide back and you can have access. And here's your uh, USB and USB-C. There's your Band-Aid when you have a drone accident. I'm not going to tell you why I say that. Uh, here we have, you can lift the whole thing up here. And it's uh, it's spacious. You got a lot of space. Got a lot of little quirky little things that you can move around and do stuff with to compartmentalize as you desire. Well, I'm going to need this again, I think. I'm, I'm going to be flying later today. So anyway, so that's cool. And then we come around, got to come all the way over here. And here we have quite a bit of stuff. We have our uh, rear cab lighting, exterior lighting is currently set on door. Uh, but does this also mean the interior lighting? Um, no, that's the outside lighting. Then you have your automatic uh, flashers adjustment so that it will in fact uh, flashers. God, what am I talking about? High beam. If you wanted to adjust the high beam for you when you encounter other vehicles on the road and you're using your high beams, you turn that on. This you open with all hybrids because of uh, all kinds of evaporative commission, uh, commission, emission things. Well, I'm talking like a, like a regular uh, auctioneer today. I mean, yeah. Anyway, this is the, you have to press this in order, and then you have a set amount of time that, to put gas in it because it's all an emissions thing. It's no big deal. Uh, but it also is nice because you, you have a degree of lockage to your uh, gas cap, which has been a problem. I don't know why so many of these pickups, they don't have any kind of a locking gas cap or gas flap situation so that people are not encouraged to steal your gas because people will do that. Uh, and then we have our rear obstacle thing you can turn off. Then we have your odometer trip selector. Then you have your heated steering wheel all the way down here. Why it's not up here, I don't know. And here we have our running boards. We have automatic. It's on automatic right now. We can turn this off or we can put them out. Did you hear that? And then we'll close them. And now we'll put it back on automatic. So there. Oh, yeah. Now, now see, I'm already exhausted. There's so much. It's like being in the, a uh, lot like the GMC Denali Ultimate is much like this. Uh, it's interesting. They both compete directly with each other. And uh, I'll, uh, let's see, what do I remember? Well, I remember that the Denali was about 8000 excuse me, about $3,000 more expensive than this had the super fancy tailgate with the kicker sound system that comes out of it for your tailgating activities. Uh, it also had a composite bed, I think, I think, or it was covered with a composite. Uh, almost identical payload capacities between these two vehicles. The towing capacity, I'm not sure about. Uh, but I will tell you one thing, I'm sure this Tundra gets much better gas mileage 
than that uh, 6.2 liter V8 that was in the uh, Denali. But they're very different, and the Denali also has full-time four-wheel drive. So, wow, our, our, our oil pressure just died because the engine turned itself off. Amazing that. Anyway, here we have, this is all for your selection for your, uh, this is how you talk to the Google, actually. There. Sorry, I'm having trouble understanding you. Yeah, join the club. Uh, <laughs> And here we have our, uh, this, is, this is what I was just using to navigate the screen up there, you see? You see? You see? Why, is it, why is it doing this? There we go. There we go. You see? You see? There, there, there we are. Okay. There, there we go. Okay, okay. So, that's that. Let's go back to my favorite one. There we go. Okay, so, now we already dropped down to 17 miles per gallon because I've been sitting here idling a lot. Of, so, whew, thirsty, thirsty little boy. Okay, now on the right-hand side, we have our Cruise Central, which uh, also, we also have our uh, mode selector and our pre-selected uh, radio channel selector right down here. This is our cruise control, uh, resume, plus, set, minus, the usual, canceling. Lane, uh, uh, what is it called? Steering assist, lane centering. That's what that's called. And I have to hold it down to turn it off. There. Yeah, I gotta hold down for about five seconds to turn it off. And then we have our following distance right there. Okay, wow, this has been busy. So, <laughs> are you still with me? God bless you. You're, 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 you're one in a million. Oh, let's go up here. What do we have up here? Well, we have this. We have, look at there. Oh, isn't that great? Try that, GMC Ultimate. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, what else we have? We have, oh, the roof opens. This magnificent panoramic roof, which is vast. That opens. Uh, and then we have, uh, oh, the shade. Let's close the shade even though it will make this cab really dark. But those things, the, these panorama roofs are all the rage and they do really give you, a, I believe, a sense, a sense of airiness. Uh, it's too claustrophobic now. One thing I have a problem with on this truck, take a look at this. The hoods, it just dominates and I feel like I'm squinting because the hood is so high and I, uh, I'll be driving the, uh, 2014 previous generation Tundra back to back with this tomorrow and when I do that one of the first things I'm going to look at because I don't feel like the hood is it it doesn't feel the same it feels like you, you don't have the squattage the narrowness the almost claustrophobicness of this windshield because the hood it, the hood dominates it's a dominating hood no doubt done for a reason but I don't know what uh, oh, there's something important I forgot to show you. Now this here is your selector for your, we're currently in two high. There's four wheel drive high. And then to go into four wheel drive low, we'll put her in neutral and go down in low. And we are now in four wheel drive low. And the engine has now started. But look at how small that is. Tiny little light there. Huh, it just seems it should be bigger, everybody. That's my, my feeling on this. And it, we're still in neutral, so I'll go to four high. And it's now in four high, and now I'm gonna go to two high, and bazoom, we're back to normal. So, there's that. Now, one of the things about all this right here, I've, I've, I mentioned this to Toyota when I had a discussion with one of the engineers. And I mentioned to them, I said, did you guys ever do any testing with dogs in the car? Now, why would I say that? Well. I still come back to the the farm environment right there. You, you, you see here. Uh, most people that have farms tend to have dogs. Most people that live out in the country that have a pickup tend to have a dog. And while you should have them in a carrier, that's the best, smartest way to do it and the safest. Most people, especially when they're just driving around the, the old homestead there, they don't have a uh, a carrier, the dog's just in the cab. And 
there is so much here that they can put their car. My dog on my, uh, my Forerunner has the seat heaters right here, and they're constantly turning the seat heaters on and off with their paws. And so I was thinking, I mentioned that, that you know, it makes sense to me have a lot of this should be out of, the, out of harm's way because of that reason. But I was basically told that, no, they never even thought about that. They didn't look into it. They didn't test it. And that's just the way it is. So they just didn't think that was a priority. And and for and they're you know in their defense, right? It probably isn't going to be a problem for many people. I'm just, I was just thinking about the common use scenario that I find myself in with uh, with the dogs, and they tend to uh, they tend to come up here and, and touch stuff, and you know put her in four wheel drive and uh, take your drive mode out of normal and put it on sport plus. You know, it's a dog. So, all right, are you ready for the most exciting part? The back seat. The back seat of this massive crew cab. Ugh. As you can see, the running board pops out real quick. Look at the size of the door. I mean, there, it just went back in again. Now it's gonna open up. Watch this here. Whee! Wow, there we go. Uh, the door opens about almost 90, yeah, I'd say 86 degrees right there. And uh, by the way, that's the vent right there for your hybrid battery, your lithium, uh, no, not lithium, sorry, nickel metal hydride is right there. And as you can see, there's a vast amount of space in this thing, as I previewed earlier. And here's your, uh, your very excellent LED map lights. Your window shade, woo, nice. Now, this is a big window, and you, and it's really low. You have a nice high belt line, so you can really see out of this thing. And does it go all the way down? You bet it does. You got your grip assist right here, too, so, you know, in case you start to rocking back and forth. Um, what else? Look at the look at the foot room here. I mean, you'd have to be an, a, a vast fellow in order to not have enough room here for you for your footage you also have heating and something you don't see very often the rear seat ventilation Woo! i can feel it now this is on the outboard seats by the way but still isn't that something you got ventilation and heating very nice capstone very a, a very capstone -y kind of thing that and uh, as you can see, the furnishings are nice. It's very tasteful, and you got your LED lights that are underneath the, uh, right along here. Boy, that's just nice, clever, expensive. Very, reminds me of the Hyundai, or excuse me, the Genesis. I believe it was the G90. Uh, they went crazy with the, with the lights there. Now here's our, our armrest. It's also, this is the second armrest this week that's been kind of brief, abbreviated, and, and it interferes with the cup holder. <laughs> well, not really, but, uh, but it's a good height. It's just kind of short, but maybe that's on purpose. Maybe they thought that was the better way to do it. I don't know. Uh, but incidentally, below our control array for the uh, heating and cooling of the seat area, we have uh, a couple of more USB ports, a USB and a USB-C, plus a 400 watt, look at there, that's your AC right there. You can plug in an AC thing and charge your batteries to your drone before you get injured by it. <clears throat> so you got all that going for you in this back seat, which is all great. I still think that this would be nice if it was just a uh, double cab. Uh, or, or perish the thought even a single cab version of this would be great but you know that's we're going for the lifestyle so we're going for putting all kinds of creatures and children and dogs and cats and all kinds of stuff in the back seat so we need the world's largest back seat pretty much all the crew cabs now I'd, I'd say are within an inch or two of, of each other in terms of how much room you got in the back and it's ample for just about anybody it is it is a massive, massive, massive amount of room you have it available to you. And what else do we have here? What happens if we do this? Hang on, hang on. Let me put you down for a minute. 
I'm gonna put you down right here. There we go. Uh, right there, okay. Now let's see. What does this do? Oh, I see. This is what this does. Aha! Somebody's been having uh, potato chips or something. Um, here we have our, uh, I think this is just part of the, uh, a maintenance thing for getting to your battery. This is your battery underneath here. So on the other non-hybrid versions, this is actually a storage area. But on this one, it, that's your battery. And you got so much room back here anyway, I don't think you necessarily need any of that stuff. But there we go. There's your capstone back seat. Massive. And this is the window right here that just slid down on its own. And I still really do like uh, this composite material. I think it's really good. So it'll be interesting to see how this looks in 20 years. Uh, it's probably gonna look pretty much just like this except some scars and stuff on it from use. But otherwise, it's probably gonna last a good long time. So there's your capstone. I hope you have enjoyed your interior. Well, let the adventure begin as we go back in time to 2014. It is the second generation Tundra. Oops, I didn't want to have this in the car. Damn it, that woman leaving her things. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna do the, you're experiencing the back to back. I'm not sure if I'm gonna shoot that other truck doing the same thing, cause you got so much footage already inside. But this is just uh, largely for my own edification. And the doors just locked up like they're supposed to do at about five miles an hour. Uh, just to see, just to compare, just to experience. Because this truck has a good ride on it. It has the stock suspension from that 2014, which is the TRD off-road package, which basically means it has, uh... God, everything about this thing is different. It's amazing how different these two trucks are. Uh, it has the original uh, Bilstein shocks on it, which I'm about to replace any day now. <laughs> I have the new shocks. The new, I believe they're uh, 5100s that I'm going to put on this thing just because uh, it's got 85,000 miles on it and there's rust issues with some of the shocks. Can you believe that? Otherwise the shocks are fine or good. The ones I'm putting on are a little better. But uh, the ones I'm putting on are also much better. They're zinc plated something or other on them. Uh, I have them on my, my vehicle and they do much better in terms of rust so <coughs> pardon me the first thing i noticed and, and uh, i mentioned this before is the steering is a lot looser on this it's not near as tight as on the new one but you know come to think of it now that i'm driving it's not as bad as i remember uh, i also like the mirrors on this one a little better because they're a little bigger but one of the biggest differences of all is the hood because the hood seems like it's a little lower on this one and you can see out of the truck better this seems this expanse seems larger on the uh, previous generation tundra on, on the new one i really I, I really don't know how much of that is <clears throat> you could of course measure it using uh some kind of characteristics that are uh more scientific let's say <clears throat> but in my opinion it's definitely definitely better on this truck the visibility out of the front is better they, the hood is just this domineering thing especially with those big plastic things on the left and the right <clears throat> on the uh, capstone that uh, advertise the fact that it has the uh, iForce Max engine and it just restricts visibility a little bit. It drives nice. I just wish I could see out the hood better because it didn't have these, these 
fender flary thingy items on there because I do feel like I'm squinting it with this window the way it's arranged what are you gonna do about that sort of thing you really can't do anything that's the way it is but man is it quiet this is a nice quiet truck and I'll tell you something else that's good about it is it for lack of a better term when you get into a larger family of vehicles like this this is a vehicle that feels you can kind of feel where the corners of it are very effectively and that makes it much easier to maneuver in tight spots and plus with the addition of the 360 camera obviously that helps a lot too because you can actually see things that you normally could not see but it has a real nice fit it here's an interesting thing my wife feels like and she drives our tundra more than anybody else uh, she feels like this truck feels much bigger than the previous generation and i feel exactly the opposite i feel like this truck feels smaller now i i know for a fact <laughs> sort of a fact i think i looked it up when it came out but on the double cab we have an extended we have a double cab tundra from 2014 that the rear seat has more room in it is bigger and as far as the front seat area and the crew cab version i don't know but i think it has a little bit less room but not to, not so as you'd really notice because uh, it's still got plenty. I mean, it's it's got all the room you need, especially in the back seat. You can get a couple of major Deweys back there. No problem. They'd like it. They could sit, you know what they could do? They could probably set up a little table on the middle there and play dominoes back in the back of your truck. I guarantee you somebody in Texas is doing that probably right now. They probably went down there and made arrangements with Toyota. Can I pick my truck up at the factory? It's right there in San Antonio. I'm about eight miles away from there. And uh, I said, yeah, I'm sure we could do that. <coughs> here, we'll have the dealership shine off on all this stuff. Sign here, sign here, initial here, sign here. And and they're driving around in southern Texas, maybe down to, by Yorktown or, or Beeville. And they're driving around, and there's two big fellas in the back with their hats on playing dominoes in the back seat of the crew. Well, now I understand why we have the crew cabs. That's what the, that's what they're doing. Well, why I didn't why didn't I think of that? That's what I get from not living in Texas for decades. <laughs> I just grew up there and then I left. Uh, but there there uh, there's some good old boys down there that uh, I could see that. I haven't played dominoes since I was a kid. Boy, I'd love to play a game, a uh, couple of games of dominoes. I, I liked it so much when I was a child. And it was the big old guys, the big old ranchers and stuff that were always stirring them bones, getting ready to play dominoes. Sorry, sorry, a bit of reminiscing there. Now this is a very curvy road and this car handles it very, very, car. I keep saying car, I know, this truck handles it very nicely. Kind of like a, kind of like a new Land Cruiser does. Why did I say that? Hmm, yeah, hmm. I, I, my whole thing, my whole existence is suspect. Another thing I like, while we're, I'm on the praising side of things, this is, this truck has an excellent steering wheel. It's just the right diameter. It's got, this particular one is leather ensconced leather sheathed and it just has a real good feel to it i'm pleased with that choice i still think this screen is too big something else about the le I, I have to i have to play with it but i've noticed this on a whole lot of vehicles now this white display that i feel like is i don't know why i, I feel the steely grip of google why did it do? Oh, I know why. When you slow down to a point, it uh, it turns on those cameras so that you can see around you. I don't know if that is uh, cancelable or not, but it probably is. But I like it. it. There's nothing wrong with that. Unless, of course, you're looking at the map when you pull to a stop, in which case 
There's got to be a way somehow to override that. But I, I just find the white background on these maps. And there's a lot of, like I said, I'm talking across multiple manufacturers seem to have this these days. And I don't like it. I can't see the map as well. It's not enough contrast. I need contrast in my life. Hear that? Did you, could you hear that? No, you can really hear that turbo. Which is good, you should be able, it almost sounds like a little supercharger. That's something that Toyota hadn't played with. Supercharging is, I think, one of the problems that you don't see that, that much is because it doesn't really help fuel economy at all. <laughs> it, there's a certain amount of parasitic involvement, although it depends on the type of uh, turbocharger you got. Alrighty. We're coming to the top of the world up here. Heading towards the vineyards. Let's do the thing. Let's do the measurement. There has to be the measurement, you know. I'm getting the tape ready here. There we are. Now then, let's measure, shall we? We're looking at, uh, ah, it says 22 inches to me. Mm-hmm. That is the bed depth of the 2014. Now we'll go over here to this, this item. Ugh. I don't know what that electric sound is. That's weird. Um, and here we have about, yes, 21 and a half. So that's, that's a half inch shallower. And naturally it's much shorter. I'm not even going to measure that because the crew cab is going to be shorter. I imagine the, uh, the double cab version, which is the version I would buy if I was buying one of these. Hang on a minute. How the hell are you supposed to do this thing here? Do it? Do it? Come give me a hand there. It's thing st it's stuck. As you can read right here, here's our payload, and this is the actual payload of the vehicle itself, which is very important that, uh, because you can dig through owner's manuals and things like that, but this is as equipped. This is a real accurate rendition of what the manufacturer tells you your total payload is. And in the case of the 2014 SR5 Tundra, this is 1,430 pounds. And as for the capstone, it has a, uh, a payload rating of 1,330 pounds, as you can see right there. So about 100 pounds less than the SR5. But I know how you people are, you're wondering, but hey, what about our towing capacity? Well, this is where the capstone gets some of the back. It can tow, uh, let's see here, the number I have is 10,340 pounds as opposed to 9,800 pounds for the SR5. A lofty number for the uh, capstone, but not as lofty as the price, which is which is a bit of a whopper at 77,000 plus. But it is pretty fully equipped, although there are still a few options out there that you can get. Uh, there's always more. I, I think it screams to have a uh, tonoi cover on it. So you, you should get one of them if you're going to get a capstone. And so how is this all new Tundra compared to the old one? Well, it, it depends on your taste. I think, uh, like I said before, it's much more of a lifestyle vehicle than the old pickup was. But it's still got a lot going for it and it does make more power and gets better gas mileage than the Tundra Presidia. And that's something, that's actually a lot. Y'all take care out there, be careful. We'll see you soon. Es ist ein Kreuz, ein Vielheit.